Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Okay, welcome to another exciting version of Cannabis Common Sense. I'm very happy to have Farmer Tom Lorman on the show. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, it's good for you to be back. Yeah. You've uh, got a university. You're teaching people about hemp. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. Cool. I'm looking look at forward to it. The past. We have our hemp news segment. We uh, have a number of videos to roll in. So stand by as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Okay, our first story tonight is from Washington, D.C. Those applying for U.S. citizenship may be denied if they have personally used marijuana or if they've been employed in the marijuana industry, including in jurisdictions where such activities are legally authorized, according to a newly released guidance memo by the United States Citizen and Immigration Services, or UC, USCIS. The memo opines that any involvement with marijuana is indicative of a lack of, quote, moral character, end quote. Moral character is a prerequisite for people seeking U.S. citizenship. The updated language states, quote, the violation of federal controlled substances law, including for marijuana established by a conviction or admission, is generally a bar to establishing good moral character for naturalization even where the conduct would not be a violation of state law. This guidance is controlling and supersedes any other prior guidance on the topic." End quote. The Customs and Immigration Service is a branch of the United States Department of Homeland Security. They got it wrong. You know, that's just disgusting. Uh, Bank of America's Merrill Lynch goes green, one of the biggest U.S. financial institutions. We could say they lack moral character. Took a deeper dive in the medical cannabis industry by launching uh, coverage of the sector. Bank of America Merrill Lynch analyst Chris Carey initiated coverage of the broader industry and some of its market leaders, Aurora Cannabis, Canopy Growth, Cronus Group, the Green Organic Dutchman, Hexo Corporation, and Supreme Cannabis. This isn't Bank of America Merrill Lynch's first foray into cannabis. Last summer, the bank helped finance uh, global liquor giant Constellation Brands' $3.8 billion investment in Ontario-based canopy. It was the first time Bank of America Merrill Lynch financed a cannabis deal. After Bank of America, Merrill Lynch financed the largest M&A transaction to date in North America's cannabis sector. Initiating regular analysis was the next logical step. It also shows that cannabis is becoming more mainstream on Wall Street, although the financial hurdle won't fall until action is taken at a national level in Washington, D.C. Going forward, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, could finance more cannabis transactions and equity raises. More investment banks in New York may look into getting involved now. Up in Washington State, legislators in Washington State passed several cannabis bills of interest to the marijuana industry in the final days of the session that concludes this weekend. The measures include one that reforms enforcement procedures and another that allows marijuana product labels to convey their intended use, such as to help people sleep. The bill now will go to Governor Jay Inslee, a Democrat, for his signature. Here are some of the measures that passed and their potential business impact. Uh, Washington Senate Bill 5318 reforms the compliance and enforces provisions for marijuana licensees. In marijuana businesses and trade associations previously complained about inconsistent and unfair enforcement. 
Under this bill, the State Liquor and Cannabis Board, LCB, can issue licensees a notice of correction describing a non-compliant condition instead of a civil penalty. In addition, a single violation won't result in a license being revoked unless the violation meets certain conditions such as the illicit sale of marijuana across state lines or furnishing cannabis to minors. Then there's Senate Bill 5298, which allows marijuana product labels to include claims that describe the product's intended role in maintaining or structure or function of the body, such as sleep. Then there's House Bill 1792, which reduces the criminal charge from a felony to a gross misdemeanor for a bun tender at a licensed shop who sells marijuana to someone younger than 21 years of age. Then last but not least, House Bill 2052 establishes a cannabis science task force to develop laboratory quality standards. Also transfers the authority for testing lab accreditation from the Liquor and Cannabis Board to the Department of Ecology, effective July 1st, 2024. Hey, that's more than five years from now. In Trenton, New Jersey, employers may not discriminate against medical cannabis patients, thank goodness, uh, who consume marijuana while away from the job, according to a state appellate court decision. The New Jersey appellate court's decision reverses a lower court opinion. While the court opined that employers are not required to accommodate the use of medical marijuana by patients in any workplace, the uh, Justice has also acknowledged that the plaintiff's marijuana use in this case took place solely during off work hours. They wrote, quote, the Compassionate Uses Act's refusal to require an employment accommodation for a user does not mean that the Compassionate Use Act has immunized employers from obligations already imposed elsewhere, end quote. The court determined, explicitly citing New Jersey's laws against discrimination. This case, Wild versus Carriage Funeral Holdings, LLC, uh, the courts in a number of other medical marijuana states, uh, including uh, Arizona, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, they've all uh, issued similar rulings affording workplace protections for qualified patients. Out of Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, Republican Governor Doug Burgum has signed legislation amending the state's nascent medical cannabis access program. House Bill 1283 permits physician assistants to recommend cannabis to qualified patients. House Bill 1417 permits patients with cancer to possess enhanced amounts of cannabis flour, up to six ounces, when explicitly authorized by a recommending health care provider. House Bill 1519 significantly expands the pool of patients eligible for medical cannabis therapy to include those diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, migraines, anorexia, and Tourette's syndrome, among other debilitating conditions. Though approved by voters in 2016, the state's medical cannabis access program is not yet fully operational. A single dispensary opened in Fargo, North Dakota in March, and additional licensed facilities are anticipated to open later this summer. Next story. <coughs> Republican leaders in Wisconsin state legislature said that Governor Evers' medical cannabis and decriminalization budget proposals will not be passed through the legislature this session. That's no surprise for those of us who follow what goes on in Wisconsin. But at least they've got a decent governor now. Maine regulators are finally moving forward with draft regulations to implement the state's 2016 voter-approved initiative legalizing the commercial production and retail sale of marijuana. Maine issued resident-friendly draft rules for its recreational marijuana industry more than two years after voters legalized adult use. Key business provisions of the draft rules, which now will go through a public comment period, include the state will make licenses available for cultivation, four tiers plus a nursery license, processing, retail, and testing. Municipalities where planned sites are located must approve the business. Until June 1, 2021, Every officer, director, manager, and general partner of a business must prove Maine residency, and Mainers must hold the majority of the equity. Our next story is about the vaporizer company. Pax Labs, a San Francisco manufacturer of vape pens, raised $420 million. What an odd number, 420. The largest amount ever raised for a U.S.-based marijuana company. That number, far larger than the initial targets of $150 million, came from both existing and institutional investors. PAX, which spun off from e-cigarette maker Juul in 2017, 
formed in 2007. PAC CEO Bharat Vasan said in a news release that the money would allow the company to explore new market opportunities such as CBD as well as international expansion. Vasan said that PACs would look at opportunities in Europe and Asia as well as Canada. Investigator, or investors said the funding would free up multiple opportunities for uh, them to grow. Troy Dayton, the CEO of the ArcView Group, said, quote, I would be shocked if PAX does not become an acquirer of adjacent products or technologies with that kind of balance sheet, end quote. Our next story is from New York. The use of cannabis is associated with symptom mitigation and reduced consumption of pres prescription drugs in patients with multiple sclerosis, according to data published in the journal Neurology. A team of investigators from the Dent Neurological Institute in New York performed a retrospective chart review of 77 multiple sclerosis patients undergoing treatment with medical cannabis. The majority of subjects reported reductions in pain and nearly half reported improvements in spasticity and sleep. The study says, quote, in addition, 34% of patients were able to decrease or discontinue other medications, including opioid stimulants, benzodiazepines, indicative of symptom improvement, end quote. The authors concluded, quote, patients with multiple sclerosis who initiated medical cannabis treatment experienced improved symptomology with good tolerability and were able to decrease or altogether discontinue opioids, stimulants, and benzodiazepines, end quote. Their findings are consider, uh, consistent with those of a number of other studies that we cover here every week. There seems like there's about 40 or 50 new studies a year uh, on uh, patients' initiation of cannabis therapy. A marijuana plant-derived oral extract drug, Sativex, is approved for the treatment of MS-related spasticity in a number of countries, including Canada and the United Kingdom. This study, Multiple Sclerosis and the Use of Medical Cannabis, a Retrospective Review Evaluating Symptom Outcomes, appears in this month's edition of the magazine, Neurology. From Geneva, Switzerland, the daily administration of plant-derived extracts containing a two-to-one ratio of CBD to THC is associated with a reduction in agitation and behavioral problems in patients with severe dementia, according to clinical data published in the journal Medical Cannabis and Cannabinoids. A team of Swiss investigators assessed the use of cannabis extracts over a two-month period in a group of 10 female dementia patients residing in a nursing home facility. The patients demonstrated reduced levels of agitation, rigidity, and behavioral problems following cannabis treatment. Half of the subjects decreased or ceased their use of other medications. The authors wrote, quote, an oral cannabis extract with THC CBD was well tolerated and greatly improved behavior problems, rigidity, and daily care in severely demented patients, end quote, the authors concluded. In prior clinical trials, the administration of oral synthetic THC capsules, or Marinol, is associated with reductions in Alzheimer-induced agitation. This study, Prescription of THC CBD-based medication to patients with dementia, a pilot study in Geneva, appears in this month's edition of Medical Cannabis and Cannabinoids. And that is the end of our hemp news segment. Uh, our normal uh, song singer here, musician, John Cornett, is out sick. He's feeling better, fortunately. We expect him back next week. But uh, we're going to run a, another video from uh, uh, a previous year's great uh, global marijuana march. So we'll be right back after this video. the unnatural reality. A need to be, a need to see. Grass fire, my DNA needs THC. In the unnatural society, been trying to maintain 
on the scene appear to be clearly insane with no way to explain outlasting the great law a sparking spark does my mind grass fire pulling the sky breathing in sativa's design That's the way these fires burn. Okay, well, that was John Trudell at uh, the uh, Hemp is Earth Medicine Tour back in 2010. It was actually uh, nine years and two days ago that that was taped down in uh, Southern Oregon. Welcome back one more time, Tom. Yeah, it's good to, to have you back on yeah, again. Definitely. And so uh, uh, you have been doing so much in this sector since we first met you. It seems like it's been about five years now that we first had you on the show. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we had the guys from Barcelona on there. Yeah. The show. Yeah. 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 That was good. Yeah. That those guys are awesome. Got, they are. I got they to are. go visit them last year uh -huh. for Spanibus. Ah, okay. Yeah. I visited them, uh, oh, it was back in 2014, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I was I down remember there. I was at Expo Grow, which is on the other side, the north side of Spain. Oh, but, nice. Uh, okay. I got down to Barcelona and, yeah, was, they have a nice little club there. Yeah, they do. They have it's a lot beautiful. of Chris Maynard's Roach Art, where yeah, he makes yeah, all this yeah. art with Roach yeah, paper. Yeah, I yeah, they yeah, had yeah. That, some of your stuff in there yeah. back then. Yeah, so, yeah, we've been good friends for a long time, and they're amazing people. They've done a lot of really good down there. They were yeah. one of the first clubs down there, the social Grinardo. club. Yeah, Grinardo. Grinardo. So if you're ever in Barcelona, look my friends up down there. They're amazing people, and they, they do a really good job at growing down there. You were talking about law, uh, new legislation on industrial hemp that just passed in Washington State. They yeah, didn't it's cover on the, yeah, it's on the uh, governor's desk to be signed. Like those other five bills. Yeah, uh huh. And what it does is uh, it frees them up to grow uh, for cannabinoids and not just for the fiber in the seeds. Okay, so and you can grow for CBD. And, yeah, they and can CBG and yeah, not THC though. Not THC. So uh, uh, what else it can do is you can buy seeds from anywhere in the United States, mm -hmm. as opposed to previous laws, you could only buy seeds for fibers and seeds mm -hmm. out of Canada and I think the Netherlands are the I two see. places. Mm -hmm. But they've kind of wiped that whole law clean, and uh, uh, it makes it pretty. It makes it doable. So mm -hmm. um, what uh, what they're what are seeds going for? There's I've heard some people say they're selling them for as much as a dollar a piece. Yeah, they're feminized seeds, and I'm not mm -hmm. a big feminized seed fan because yeah, you have either. to buy seed every year. Mm -hmm. And I'm more about buying regular seed and creating mm -hmm. your own foundation seed for your own farm, mm -hmm. for your own region. Well, it's seed or grain that is the most valuable product right now, and it's something that I think there's a shortage of. You can sell well, seed and know. grain. Well, you know better than I. <laughs> yeah, so. the prices. See, so 
here's the here's the breakdown. Okay. It costs you about ten to thirteen thousand dollars an acre to grow an acre of hemp. And so those costs are those not costs seed, are, well, not just it, seed, it, not just seed, seeds and or clones, all your irrigation, your labor, taxes on your labor, mm -hmm. everything to drying to getting it ready to. So sell. about thirteen thousand dollars. Yeah. Per, how per, much do seeds per, account for that? Uh, well, it all depends on. what kind of seeds you get. These feminized seeds are a dollar. Like what if you were going to get seed that you wanted to grow that weren't feminized? So um, are too hot. That's a big. No, you don't no, want they, them to be over yeah, zero point three percent. we sell them by yeah. the pound, uh -huh. and they go for about four thousand dollars a pound. And there's anywhere between twenty-seven thousand and thirty-one thousand five hundred seeds per pound I of see. hemp seed. So about four thousand a pound for yep. twenty-seven to forty thousand seeds. Yeah, to thirty-one thousand five hundred. Okay, seeds. twenty-seven to thirty-one yeah, five. It, it, I think it's like twenty or th twenty thirty cents a seed. I see. I see. So uh, I think that's what the breakdown is. But I think that's a smarter way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of genetics out there that haven't had the proper time, you know, the proper rotations. You know, you need like three really good rotations to have a good stable genetics. Stable crop and yeah. yeah and if you don't have stable genetics that means you have hermaphrodites and all kinds of other issues or that things come that out can go above field. yeah the zero point three which yeah. could and cause a big problem yeah and everybody's uh you know trying to make a quick buck on this mm -hmm. deal so there's a lot of seeds out there with shady pa you know not so mm -hmm. stable paths and mm -hmm. um you know i just encourage them to get paperwork of at least three c of a's from three flips of that crop certificates of analysis, analysis. to prove what the yeah. thc content yeah, the is THC below the requirement the CD, yeah below the requirement and to make you sure want high cbd if you're growing for cbd right yeah but i, I think the whole cbd thing's gonna you know with the federal government uh, mm -hmm. giving uh, some patent and some exploratory work to um, i forget which company it is but that kind of knocks the whole CBD thing off the table. Mm -hmm. I think it's well, I heard last year it was really high, and this year it's down around 5,000 uh, a kilogram for 95% or better CBD. Yeah, Is that and that's your experience? An, I, yeah, and that's isolate too. Mm -hmm. I think I think all that isolate stuff is going to be gone. You know, it's mm -hmm. the entourage effect. It's all the cannabinoids and the terpenes working together, mm -hmm. and I think that's the reason has it hasn't been legalized up to date. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the scientists and the and the pharmaceutical companies want to rip it apart, say there's two components, THC and CBD, and then we just want to work with those. But we know, after being in this industry so long, I think I've, I've heard up to 140 different cannabinoids and you know up to 20 different. Yeah. Uh, when uh, I first compounds. got interested in this, they knew about four cannabinoids yeah. back in the 70s. And then it went up to like 12 and yeah. then 15. And now it's like 140 or yeah, more. Something. And they're discovering new ones all the all, time. Right? Yeah, definitely. And so it's all about the entourage effect. So for me, it's about educating. Um, it's all about educating. You know, talking about educating, I'm going to stop you right there because we have this video about educating from the Global Marijuana March. You know, the Global Marijuana March happens next week on Saturday March 4th in almost 300 different cities all around the world. The ones down in South America in Santiago, Chile, they have 400, 450,000 people marching a year. And in Buenos Aires, two or 300,000. Here in Oregon, we've been having about 200. Our high was about 700 people. But we hope you come out to Pioneer Courthouse Square next Saturday, the 4th. We'll have uh, Chris Conrad and Mickey Norris. We'll have uh, Dr. Janice Knox and her father, uh, David Knox, uh, or actually Dr. Rachel Knox. Janice is her mother and David's uh, wife. And Rachel is on the Oregon Cannabis Commission, a medical cannabis advisory board. Yeah, they're amazing. Are, are you going to be down there this year? Um, you got no, I'm going to be. You got to teach a class in Southern well, Oregon. Yeah, right? I'm down at Hemp University down there, and mm -hmm. uh, we're doing a one day really crash seminar. We've done one before, and this is really helping the new farmers uh, get a good start on the season. Mm -hmm. So I'll be down there. Uh, yeah, doing all day. A class. Yeah, well, doing, doing a, a, doing a class work. all day Saturday. It's in Ashland. Well, I uh, know you'll be there in in spirit. In spirit Here, no doubt. Here's this little video all from right, uh, last year's. Event, I believe. Hey, thank you guys. Thanks for everybody showing up. If we don't show up, we don't blow up. So we encourage everybody to get out to all the events. Represent and make sure that we can hold the people who got this industry moving. 
that we can all transition into this industry. These green rushers are moving in. They're trying to, like, wipe us all out for pennies on the dollar. That's been their plan. They really have no heart and soul into cannabis. So when you go out there and spend your hard-earned money on cannabis, support the stores and support the locations that support the people who brought you here. It's been a long road for all of us. Uh, my wife was part of the first collective garden in San Diego in 1996. Our collective got uh, raided in San Diego in 1999, where I was arrested for 448 plants. Uh, we've done a lot of things. Everybody's done a lot of things. We put a lot of energy into this, and we need to get something back. You know, we really need to hold on to our medical laws. We'll be seeing what happened in Washington uh, is a disgrace to medical, and it's really a disgrace to all the efforts that everybody put in. The same people who fought against this tooth and nail, Inslee and all the rest of us, who fought against cannabis, now will go to the debt to protect the tax dollar. So the, our, our plan really worked. Our plan was to, like, get them addicted to the money, and then we'll be able to legalize. So they're all addicted. It's spreading across the country. States are lining up. They all want to cash in on it. But we still need to show up at these events and let our voice be heard to make sure that the small guys and the small farmers and the craft farmers don't get wiped out. The big talk now is the race to the bottom. Well, we saw the race to the bottom come in years ago because there's big corporations already out there who, who are ready to lose 30 to $50 million to create market to capture market share. So when you go out there, make conscious choices on what you buy. Buy organic, buy clean, buy local, just like we do here in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. We need to do the same for cannabis. It's not about the dollar. The lower the price, the probably the crappier weed you're getting. So support your local uh, growers, organic growers, and keep on showing up at the events and, you know, show up on a regular basis and you can really make a change in the cannabis movement so thank you so much for everybody coming out today uh i want to thank normal and parents for pod and paul sanford and their group and everybody for keeping oregon on on you know going i want to thank anna diaz for kind of being the backbone here and madeline martinez and all of these people who have really brought us here today and got us through legalization so thank you so much for supporting cannabis in oregon and uh Show up and blow up. All right. <laughs> Surprised. <laughs> I hate watching myself. <laughs> oh, well. You know, it's all right. It's you're getting good. It's you're getting yeah, good. <laughs> this is the wrong place to be if you hate watching yourself. But, you know, you were talking about the class you're going to be down in Ashland yeah. teaching. You want to talk more about that? Yeah. We're, we've, we've done a series. We've done a, a previous class. Mm -hmm. That was really successful. Um, in Ashland at yeah, the Southern it, Oregon University? Yeah, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was really, we had people from all over the country come, all, mm -hmm. all these farms. There's a lot of people down there. I know that guy Bruce Perlowin has been down there, too. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah. He's, he's kind of running the whole Hemp Inc. and uh -huh. Hemp University uh, deal down there. Is and that what you've got? I know you, you are you working with him? Or is no, it, no, what's the I have my, thing? I, what, I got what my is own it? Did you start hemp? it? I invited I, you to come on to talk yeah, about what you Yeah, it's. You uh, it's but it's not what he's doing. No, it's no, it's totally different. I'm doing okay. my own thing. Yeah. Um, I was finding myself getting really spread out, mm -hmm. and I travel so much, and, mm -hmm. you know, your dogs miss you, and yeah. puppy separation, and all I that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was trying to find a way that I could help out a, a larger group of people at a better cost. Mm -hmm. um, farmers, traditionally, were all cheap. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? We're our own plumbers. We're our own electricians. We're mm -hmm. our, our own backhoe guy. We we do it all right. because if we didn't, we'd be flat busted like Dolly Parton before we knew it. You know what I yeah. mean? So uh, you know, it, it's all about saving money. And a lot of these consultants out there, they want a large a large money uh, chunk up front, and then they want thirty percent of your crop. So I'm thinking, well, that's kind of harsh. And I know, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of farmers. You know, aren't really going to like that. So I, um, a movie producer guy who's grown some hemp out there, got in touch with me, asked me if I wanted to be kind of the face of it, and I said, sure. That seems to tidy up some issues that I have, and it could keep me, you know, more around Portland during the summertime and on my own farm, taking care of, you know, things things over there. Yeah, and, you can't uh, leave your farm for long. They need to be looked at every day. You yeah, have somebody looking yeah, at it every day. Yeah, I got Dwayne and not. yeah and Paula. They're real. They're really good at watching things while i'm gone good uh the the class is an online course 
Mm -hmm. kind of covers, covers everything from seed to sale, from, mm -hmm. you know, prepping your land to starting your seeds to cloning to sexing mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, laying the, the black mulch and the tea tape and prepping your fields and planting. And we go through every, every stage of the whole deal. Plus, you can ask questions uh, through the through the site. And you can also we had a private Facebook group mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where people members are able to ask questions mm -hmm. and then we do our best to answer them all week. But every Saturday I have a, a live Facebook feed. Let me just say, if you're out there and you have a question for us, you can call us at that number there on your screen. It's 503-288-4442. If you have any questions for Farmer Tom or myself about hemp or cannabis, now's the time to call at 503-288-4442. I just had to throw that in there. Oh, yeah. So the, uh, the class is doing really well. We've got people from all over the world, Japan, uh, uh, Europe, UK, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. all, everybody's interested in learning about how to grow hemp. And, you know, hemp's really hot right now. So thank goodness. Yeah. The planet it's about, sorely needs it. It's about time. You know? you know, there's so many different problems we can solve with hemp. I mean, you know, it takes adoption agriculturally on a massive scale, but we got to ramp that up and it can stop deforestation, wipe out world hunger, slow global warming, try to save some of what's left of the biosphere out there. It can also stop MRSA. Yeah, yeah. So that what they're doing up there in has Minnesota, all those medicinal capacity. What they're doing in Minnesota right now is they they have a factory that produces textiles and linens, and they're making sheets for the hospitals from hemp fiber. For hemp fiber, because MRSA can't live on hemp fiber. Well, thank goodness. And when it goes through the wash, and when MRSA goes through the wash with cotton, it can come out still active on the other end. Mm -hmm. Mer MRSA is a huge problem. Oh, yeah. People For go to the hospital feeling all right, and they, they leave with MRSA. So if, uh, if you know, hemp is, can be used for so many things. You know, those same linens are going to be used for butchers and fishermen and all that kind of stuff who can carry, you know, uh, you know. Yeah, bacteria. Well, exactly. Just a little cut can cause uh, exactly. a life-threatening illness if you get that bacteria in your bloodstream. Exactly. So hemp does is amazing in a lot of different things. Like right now, hemp uh, the best market is for cannabinoid production. Mm -hmm. You know, and CBD uh, and CBD and, and you know, I think the whole CBD thing is going to be wa wiped out. I think you're going to be you're going to have to use vaguer language. It's going to have to be like full spectrum hemp oil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, the pricing on on hemp right now is is really high. Like Oh, uh, let's see. The flour goes from two to two to four hundred dollars a pound, mm -hmm. which is really good for hemp flour. Mm -hmm. There's a big, huge market on the East Coast for hemp flour right now. Mm -hmm. And hemp pre-rolls is a big, huge game out there. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, if you have a plant one to three pounds, take 10 percent of that plant, use that for flour and use 90 percent of that plant for biomass. Now, biomass uh, goes from anywhere from 40 to $50 or $60 a pound. And that's for extraction primarily. Yeah, that's probably for, primarily for extraction purposes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uses out there. Uh, the hemp markets, you know, it's booming right now and everybody wants to get in. So you said in. that it's about, did you say $13,000 an acre yeah. in total expenses for harvesting, curing, yeah, seed, and on the, irrigation? And on, the, and on the low end, you can make about eight. Uh, Eighty to ninety thousand dollars per totally acre. per acre. Totally Boy, that is realistic. a killer profit for any farmer. But if you do the math on the on the rest of it, if you take that ten percent of an acre, you mm -hmm. can literally make. If you grow up to three pounds, you can literally do really well on on even five acres. There's a chance you'll make several hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So the the markup's more than anything else ever. Yeah, you know um, the market for uh, growing seeds and and stocks is a lot less. Uh -huh. So there's about a five to seven dollar, uh, seven thousand with seed to get it all in the ground. But then you're selling it for only fifteen to twenty thousand for that acre. You I know? see. I so see. The so that profit, just barely that covers your cost with a few thousand. Yeah, with that's expert, more like your typical agricultural. Yeah, you double you double crops, your right? money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you put put in and double your get your money back and you make a little that get them as much. 
So uh, you know, here I've just got to point out, since we got it on the camera, is our hemp flame freedom. This is hemp seed oil with a hemp wick. Here's next week's hemp wick. We have our hemp fiber string and hempcrete, a building material that uh, another farmer in uh, in Nebraska, farmer Bill, made that for us. So uh, <laughs> nice. Yeah, we got to introduce you to him. Some yeah, point. definitely. Um, so that's a pretty good profit if they're growing for the extraction market with flowers and, and it's biomass. A, it's a really good market. I think there's a good two to three year window before we get oversaturated. Mm -hmm. uh, just like the cannabis industry in Washington, it was a race to the bottom. And in Oregon. And we're seeing it's a race to the bottom in Oregon. And the same thing's happening in California. So I'm just, I try to give, give everybody real good information. I'd say, you know, you got two to three years. And any time after that, if you have a good relationship with a, a, a successful processor, you could be making money after that also. So, it's so what do you think about the auto flowering seeds again? The auto, the yeah, they, what, what are their drawbacks? I know they're more expensive. That's one thing. And they, they treat them with a plant hormone to make them yeah, I'm auto not a, flower, I'm not right? A big, yeah, I'm not a big auto flower fan. Yeah, I'm, me and either. I'm not a big, I like and organic. I'm, yeah, I'm not a big feminized... You know, yeah. I, I say you need to be a real farmer and grow regular seed and then, you know, sex them before you put like just like we do mm -hmm. sex them mm -hmm. before you put them in the ground mm -hmm. and then and then watch them throughout the season. You know, mm -hmm. because usually the males are the biggest ones and the ones you wanted to make it most because they're so big and healthy. And mm -hmm. usually those are the ones that we missed when we sexed mm -hmm. and we, we need to take out. So well, I we, really encourage everybody to be a real farmer and, uh -huh. you know, um, the safety of, of buying feminized seeds, I guess it gives people a little bit of peace of mind. But when you're dealing with these feminized seeds and these exotics that we've never heard about before, I think people should stay with cherry wine and cherries and some of the those the, are some varieties or strains exactly that, are that high a, cbd high cbd low thc mm -hmm. and they're generally stable genetics mm -hmm. you know when and but everybody wants the exotics you know mm -hmm. so but we don't know how how those seeds were mm -hmm. propagated and, and if they actually took the time and that it takes to create stable genetics. Mm -hmm. We have a video with our friend Jorge Cervantes here uh, at Spanibus, which you know you went to last year, but we didn't go this year. And he's talking to one of the people who first developed these auto flowering seeds. So we'll be right back after this uh, video. I'm Jorge Cervantes, and I'm here with the Seedsman Crew. And here we are at Spanabis 2019. And there's a there is a line that goes all the way to the street out there. It took me five minutes just to walk down here. Okay. And then it goes all the way in. And we're not we're about a third of the way, maybe half of the way in right now. You can see people coming in all the time. And you know the first guy we see here, who is this? But Sasha. This is Mr. Lowrider, Mr. Auto Flower and himself. He's the guy that started Auto Flower Plants, Auto Flower Cannabis Plants. Sasha, how you doing? Good to see Great you, man. Great to see you, man. Yeah, man. So you're just in here from Canada, are you? Yeah, you bet. I wouldn't miss it. I've been coming to Spanavis for quite a few years now. It's the best. Actually. Yeah, man. I know. I see you all the time here, you know, for yeah. years and years. Well, I come to see you, you know? <laughs> The rest is a bonus. Well, thanks, thanks. I'm flattered. I'm flattered. Well, tell me, you know, I mean, you, you've got a real long history with this. How did you do this? I mean, uh, how did you start? I mean, you, you've got the Polish ancestry, right? Is, right, is that, right, is that right. correct? And yeah, yeah, yeah. You're heading the right direction. Uh, well, my father grew up in Poland, right? Okay. And he, uh, you know, he remembered as a kid growing up with hemp plantations that were, you know, up to like 15 foot tall. It was kind of play uh, hide and seek in, in there, you know, <laughs> and there's a lot of folk stories about hemp in Polish culture. Uh, so, yeah, my father, he, he, he arrived in, in Canada in 68, okay. summer of love. Oh, he right. discovered marijuana, he discovered, <laughs> he, be, you know, he became something of a hippie and uh, joined this, there was a back to the land movement. Uh, when I was a baby, we, we bought a farm, moved out to the country, started growing dope, raising goats, and uh, that's the kind of milieu I grew up in. 
Uh, so it's you could say it's a bit of a family tradition. Right. My father right. was one of the first guys in our area to grow Cincinnati. Really? Brought in some Colombian. They traveled a lot. Brought in some Colombian genetics, some uh, yeah. Afghani genetics, and uh, so I grew up. Uh, you know, I, I did the chores. I was uh, you know started pretty young, watering his plants, making sure uh, everything was safe. <laughs> I grew up sort of with this conspiracy thing where we gotta you know we gotta keep quiet. It right. Not, right. It wasn't out in the open. It was illegal. My my father actually paid the price for that. Hmm. Spent some time in prison. So many people did pay that price. They sure did. A lot of people that we knew did. And uh, so I grew up kind of wanting to work with cannabis, uh, passionate about the plant, trying to find a way to stay safe and keep the people around me safe. That's why I dabbled a little bit in, in hemp. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, find, uh, found myself a nice little niche in seed production. Autos were really developed for like just uh, anybody, not necessarily a professional grower, right? Auto flowers are kind of a, it's kind of a democratic, like, uh, it's for the people. It's very, that's the point, very easy to grow. And uh, well, that's a good thing. That's a, that's a real good thing. And I'm, I'm thinking about the first. The first auto flower I saw was one that you showed me. And this baby was with the decent bud that was a little low yeah. rider, it was that tall. Yeah. Now these things are over a meter tall. I exactly. mean the incredible amount of work you've done on this. Well, yeah, and a lot of people have contributed. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, That's provided good. a bit of the spark to start it off, but so many people joined up. I mean it's gotten so much bigger than me so so quickly. The thing is at the beginning we looked at the plant more as kind of a novelty. It's a cute miniature plant you can grow in your, in your uh, closet, in your garden, and your neighbors won't even see. It was kind of a curiosity, <laughs> it was kind of a cool thing. But we didn't exactly know how to maximize its output back then. Right. So we used small pots, and if you give it a small pot, you get a small plant. <laughs> right? Uh, realized pretty soon that um, using, just giving it more, it, it, it'll give you back that. As well, the genetics, we, as you cross it, again, like back crossing with Sajivas, Otto's got bigger and bigger and bigger. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's wonderful. I know there, there's a lot of people, like you say, it's really good to see you give credit to other people. Because, you know, in this breeding world, so many people are egotistic. And yeah. they just, it just doesn't work. Uh, you know. Yeah, 12 minutes. So that was Jorge Cervantes. It's Spanibus. Uh, we got to thank Jorge for that. I'm also happy to say that uh, uh, I am judging a British seed photo company uh, contest, or, or British seeds photo cup, so that uh, people can turn in pictures and win up to fifty-five thousand dollars in cash and prizes. I think the top winner gets about nine thousand U.S. seventy-five hundred British pounds. And you can find out more about that at uh, seedsman.com or on my Facebook links. It's uh, facebook.com slash D Paul Stanford. And I also want to say that right behind me for the first time in over two years, we are able to fly our regular banner. It's been two years since an Israeli Canadian oil company got an injunction to stop us from using that name and that suit was dismissed this week. We're still in litigation with them, but by dismissing the lawsuit, their injunctions go away and we can use our net banner and our name again. So thank you. Yeah, it's uh, a it's small been a long victory. Run for you, Paul. It has, it has. It's just a small step. Uh, uh, it wasn't entirely beneficial, uh, but uh, we're going to appeal that ruling based on some of the bad things it'll do. I won't go into it right now, but let's get back to him. So how do people find out about your online school? Well, um, you can uh, Google or go to hempfarmingacademy.com. Mm -hmm. Hempfarmingacademy.com. Yep, yeah. and uh, all the information's right there. You can sign up. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a pretty good little package. I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about it. You know, how many hours of instruction do you get to go through there, and is it set now? Is it finished? Are you going to keep adding? No, we're to keep it? we're keeping adding adding to it as the season goes along. You know, we're up mm -hmm. to irrigation right now because that's where everybody's at, and we mm -hmm. we try to stay a little bit ahead of the curve this year and helping everybody uh, get through the season, and. Um, 
yeah, we kind of go in pretty in depth into everything. And then if you have questions, you can ask it on the Facebook group and I'll answer it either within 24 hours or get back to you, I'll answer it on Saturday. And then if you want some one-on-one, uh, one-on-one, you can, you know, schedule some time with me if mm-hmm. somebody's in a pickle. Mm-hmm. So we, we try to like... You've got an emergency and they need your help. help right away. They yeah, they can, can pick they up can. the call and, you know, and I'll uh, guide them through and we'll mm-hmm. do the best we can to, to help eliminate their issues. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a better way. We figured and, and, you know, it doesn't spread me out so thin and I help a, a larger group of people. So I'm, I'm, I'm an educator at heart, you know, working at Clark College and then work, mm-hmm. educating the federal government. And yeah, talk about how you educate the federal government. That's a pretty interesting story. We yeah. Always, it's always good to go back on. To, first, it... It, it, it kind of started... Was it the USDA or... Yeah, well, no, it's the, it's the CDC. But uh, here's Center how it all started. Disease sta- Control. It, yeah, here's how it started. When Washington first passed their laws... They were afraid of concentrates. They were afraid of BHO. So what they said was, we're going to make all concentrates illegal, and they can only only be uh, you can only buy them in edibles. And uh, at that time, we were like every ten days there was a BHO explosion in Washington State. Yeah. And Matt Markovich from Como News asked me if I'd do an open blast, and I said sure. But we were going to give you everything. Not only BHO, but CO2 and solventless and, you know, uh, Rick Simpson oil and all the different types. We're going to show you all the different types because your idea is is concentrates for BHO and people are killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is if you don't regulate and tax it, those people will still be killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And you don't hear about very many, you know, after. Not nearly as many explosions as as you used to. So that kind of led, led it on to uh, an OSHA explosion that happened in New Mexico where a guy was killed Mm -hmm. and they got in touch with me again. And uh, I brought them over me and DJ from skunk farm research, Mm -hmm. sat down and gave them a a couple hour one-on-one about hydrocarbons and how they, you know, puddled up and the dangers of it all. Mm-hmm. And then after that, the CDC NIOSH guys through the union asked me if I wanted to uh, work with them on the first cannabis study. So uh, in I got on the phone with 10 agents from the CDC in uh, June of, of 2015. And by August, I had them on my farm for a two-day educational uh, experience where we got an introduction and introduced them to a you know, uh, production and processing of cannabis. And then they came for the actual study in October for three days. And then in 2017, the, um, the final document, the health hazard, evasion, uh, health hazard evaluation was published on the cdc.gov webpage. And now it's baseline and kind of like the foundation for all workplace health and safety in the cannabis industry. I know the United Food and Commercial Workers Union were working with you as well yeah. in uh, developing yep. worker standards. Yep. How did that go? It's going pretty good. You know, they've, uh-huh. they're, they're, they've got their feet in in California. You mm-hmm. know, anybody, um, any company that has over 20 employees has to, you know, um, be, become a union shop. Mm-hmm. And uh, the unions, you know, the unions actually do some good in this. Yeah, country. they do. They do. You I think they're I mean? wrongfully maligned. I mean, that's why we have 40 hour weeks and There's eight hour days <laughs> exactly. and uh, <laughs> minimum wages. It's actually <laughs> the vacation unions. time. Yes, unions. They've been vilified us. by the power elite. Oh, you know? no doubt. You know, the same people who brought us marijuana prohibition are the same people who tell us unions are bad. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, there are problems with everything. Oh, but, no, uh, no doubt. There's problems with everything. Yeah. So, but, but uh, you overall, know, unions have been an enormous benefit to, to the working people. Oh, that's for sure. As far as safety and health and all that stuff, yeah. uh, you know, well, let's hope this new president doesn't get rid of all the, all the work that everybody's done mm-hmm. for so many, you know, years. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that... Uh, He's doing his best to do that, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit lopsided, you know. Mm-hmm. I think... All small businesses who make under, this is my theory, 
all small businesses who make under two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year shouldn't shouldn't have to pay taxes mm -hmm. to help them get their business going. Instead That's a great of giving, idea. Instead I, of giving I the one percent, instead of giving the one percent the tax cuts, let's give the tax cuts to the mom and pops people out there really trying hard to get a I business agree. going. I don't think anybody who makes less than a hundred thousand dollars a year should even have, have to, to pay, pay taxes. taxes. I right. I agree. It's you know. it's a totally unfair system. I mean, all the tax burdens on us walmart and amazon and you know even um these largest uh, Netflix, corporations they don't, they don't pay any they don't pay any taxes yeah you know i think it really should flip around and i think they should give small business business owners zero taxes up mm -hmm. to you know let's say a quarter million dollars worth of you know gross gross sales mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know let's which make, isn't that much that, that, it isn't that, that isn't much. that much you know but it helps uh, a small business get their business. roots and going because you know, through all the regulations, state and local, and the taxes and everything, it really stops. We're seeing it in the cannabis industry. Look all across Oregon. We've seen the same thing happen in Washington. If you don't have the money to to survive these, you know, as the industry grows, then you're going to be left off at the wayside. You know, I mean, I don't know what cannabis is going for here in Oregon, but it's not much some more. Some growers than are getting a hundred dollars a pound, and you can buy some uh, for. A dollar a gram in some dispensaries. Yeah, of course, think, that's not and, the best. That's no, old and I think stuff, most of them are getting, you know, are getting a thousand. You know, if you're going good quality indoor, you can get a thousand dollars a pound. Still, I think some, indoors, though, is going to be a thing of the past. I don't think it's econo don't, ecologically I can, sustainable. Yeah, I, I like greenhouses myself with mm -hmm, light mm -hmm. up and thematically yeah. controlled, and there's some yeah. amazing greenhouses out there. That yeah. That produce really, really good. Yeah, if you can afford the cabinet. greenhouse, yeah, they're not cheap. Could, See, that's again, you know, this is where this small, the task yeah, cut. You're not going to put businesses. in very many for a quarter of a million dollars. No, you're not. You no, know, a lot of those things cost three quarters of a million dollars. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, uh, and then we see farmers putting them in the wrong direction, but that's for another show. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're down to just a few minutes left. Give us your contact information and tell people how they can hook up with you and get yeah, involved. Yeah, you can, in. um, you can find me at, at Farmer Tom Organics. And you can also find me uh, on Facebook as Farmer Tom. Uh, you can uh, find uh, uh, Farmer Tom Organics on Facebook. And I'm also on Instagram and uh, IG. I mean, Instagram and uh, Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, I do a little. You tweet. I, uh, a little bit, you know. Uh -huh. I, got a, I got a presence out there. You got to kind of keep it going. But I'm so busy, you know, you know. And it's a pleasure to work with small hemp farmers, mm -hmm. you know, instead of venture capitalists who we've been working for for the last couple of years because mm -hmm. they're not realistic. You know, they give you money and they want 18 to 24 month return right. when a restaurant takes five years to get to pr produce a profit. Farmers know what it takes to produce a crop. Yeah, so they do. But we need they, you need a couple of years to, you know, mm -hmm. make profit and get it, you know, move things along. And these uh, a lot of these venture capitalist guys. They're tech guys. Mm -hmm. So it's quick money, quick money, quick money. Well, it's agriculture. And, you know, these businesses take a while to build and to get profitable. So your website for the, the classes is HempFarmingAcademy.com. Yep, yep HempFarmingAcademy.com. Well, we've uh, got to have you back here. Maybe come thanks, July Paul. or, yeah, or I would something love to. in yeah. June, July. We'll have you back and go into a little more because we just scratched the surface. Yeah, here definitely. Love having you here. Thanks, thanks for so coming much, in, Paul. Yeah. Tom. And Good luck with everything. I'm proud of what you're doing. I want to thank our viewers. Uh, we will be back next week with uh, Chris Conrad and Mickey Norris talking about the Global Cannabis March, which is coming up. But here is a, uh, a little video with our friend Mark Sharks talking about the old Lloyd George song, Willing. Tune in next week and help us restore hemp. <laughs> Good night. Good night. It's a trucker's favorite. One of mine, too. Oh, here we go. By the rain, driven by the snow, drunk and dirty, don't you know that I'm still, Lord, I'm still. 
Out on the road late last night I seen my pretty Alice in every headlight Dallas Alice I've been from Tucson to Tucumcare To Hatchapee to Tonopah Dibbing every kind of rig that's ever been made Nothing by the clap. back road, so would not get way. You give me weed, whites, and wine. You show me.